touched me, forgave all my sin. Now forever I'll live for Him. When the Master walks by, sin is defeated. Healing can come through faith in the Son. All right, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Let's all grab our hymn book, and if you're able, turn to page 173, I'm sorry, 143. If you are able, let's stand 
first, and then we can turn to 143. 143, I stand amazed. Let's sing the first, second, and the last. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see. Will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and uh, look across the page to 144, our song for the month that we've been learning. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. 144. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills, the sun and stars that shine. Wonderful riches more than tongue can tell. He is my father, so they're mine as well. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know that he will care for me. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I appreciate the uh, new songs Brother Chad's teaching us every month. And uh, I catch myself singing them around school and stuff during the day. And Brother Scott was humming one this past week at school, and then I, I couldn't get it out of my head, and I was going and you know singing it all day. And Katie said, "It's good to hear you singing the new song, Brother Chad's teaching." I said, "Well, Scott was singing it, and I picked it up, and you know you get it in your head, and so that's a good thing to have stuck in our head." Right, Amen. Amen. Not that world's jam, jam, boogie, boogie, rock right stuff will rot your brains out anyway. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer. Ask Lord's blessing on the service. So good to see everybody out this evening, Brother Jody. Would you lift us up to the Lord in prayer? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Just a couple of announcements here. Don't forget, ladies, uh, coffee connections, lattes, all that good stuff. Uh, there'll be water, too, if you don't drink coffee. And uh, <laughs> so, hot tea, all right? I mean, hot tea. Like, isn't tea supposed to be on, like, a tall glass of ice, you know? I mean, so, all right, very good. Hot tea. I mean, what's this world coming to? We're getting so woke nowadays, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, so. I thought we threw all the tea all over into the harbor, amen, <laughs> right? <laughs> to pour it down their throats, you know. We don't, uh, okay, so uh, ladies, June, uh, January the 23rd, next Tuesday at 6.30, 6 p.m. I don't have a bulletin in front of me. Next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Yes, we got it right here. Next Tuesday at 6 p.m., January 23rd, mark your calendars. And so be here for that. You'll enjoy it. Pray for our missionary family of the week, the Bird family, serving the Lord in Ecuador. I mentioned it this morning. Also, next Saturday, weather permitting, uh, we are going to blitz USA campus. And so, uh, man, we're going with all of our guns are blazing, man. I mean, uh, hopefully they don't, they don't go out on the YouTube. <laughs> they might think we're, it's a terrorist threat. Uh, we're going to take the word of all of our swords ablazing, right? 
the Word of God. And so uh, it'll be a great time. So come out with us, uh, do some soul winning there next Saturday at 10. And then uh, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, but what we're going to do is not next, no, I'll announce it later. I am going to do a, a soul winners type class we're going to have uh, just to go over some details. We've been having a lot of people come out and uh, really want to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music. We're all handling each situation as close to the same as we can and so and be wise when we're at the door. And so I'll give you some dates and times on that, so I won't mention that right now. But we are going to do that in the future, so keep that in mind. Uh, if you would, keep Miss Elizabeth Ezell in your prayers. Uh, her grandson... Uh, his fa- her grandson's father just passed away. She has just left heading out to Illinois, and so keep them in prayer. And then also continue to pray for Tricia and Josh Newell, uh, the family there. Tricia's 20-year-old son uh, passed away yesterday, and they found him in his room. And so they're heading to Texas, and Brother Dave and Miss Kathy are heading to Texas. And so just pray for the family, that the Lord would uh, strengthen them during this difficult time. Uh, 20, I mean, it's just awful young, and so pray for them. Uh, also got a thank you card here, Pastor Tim and church. It was a blessing to be in your missions conference. Thank you for inviting Kathy and me. We always enjoy the fellowship we have with y'all. The international meal was delicious. Thank you for the love offering you gave to each of us. We appreciate it so very much. You have our prayers, David and Kathy Cook. And so praise the Lord for that. Okay, amen. Let's uh, have another hymn, Brother Chad. I almost said let's stand. <laughs> I'm remembering. Amen. Page 230 in our hymn book. 230. Glory to his name. Down at the cross where the Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to His name, glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name. Let's all stand, go ahead and walk around and welcome each other to the service this evening. All right, as we make our way back to our seats, you may remain standing. Let's go ahead and sing verse number two and then verse four as our ushers make their way down on the last verse. Verse two, I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet.
cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Amen. Brother Kurt Frazier, would you ask the blessing on the offering tonight? Amen. You may be seated. Amen. And now I am happy all the day. Galatians chapter 2. Turn there with me this evening. Galatians chapter number 2. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to be here in this book. Great book to study. Uh, Paul wrote this letter to the believers there in Galatia uh, with, with a great burden and a lot of concern for the local church there. Just to give you a little backdrop without taking too much time. Uh, uh, the church had been established. Folks had gotten saved. Uh, the church was growing. And then, uh, as it can happen so often, some false teaching began to creep into the church. And uh, some Judaizers uh, began to get in the mix there and uh, started teaching folks that, well, you know, you're saved, but uh, you, know, you, you really need the, it's the, it's the law of Moses, Moses. The Mosaic law is, is how you get saved. And, and the only way you're going to stay saved is if you keep the law. And, of course, Paul got word of that. And uh, Paul uh, said, no, nah, we're going to nip that in the bud. And uh, he wrote a letter to them, uh, this letter here, the, this epistle to the Galatians. And it's a great book, and Paul covers a lot in it. But there's a section here in chapter number 2 where you find this confrontation between the apostle Paul and Peter. And uh, it's kind of like pretty blunt. I mean, he, he calls Peter out. I mean, he literally deals with Peter face to face, the Bible says. And he does it publicly in front of other people. And some would say, oh, I cannot believe that. You know, why would he do such? You, know, you should pull him off to the side and deal with him in private. When something is done publicly and, and there's an offense that's done publicly, then the 
uh, then the dealing with that offense should be public, right? Private sin, yes, deal with it privately. Public sin, deal with it publicly. And, uh, and that's the situation here. And it really shed some light on Paul's conviction, his convictions that he had, which is a good thing. It's good when people have convictions. Uh, and I'm not talking about preferences. We all have preferences, right? I prefer not to, no, I'm not going to eat broccoli. It's not something I would die over. You know, I'm not, I mean, listen, if it was a matter of life and death, I'm going to eat that little mini shrub, okay? Uh, you know, and I might not get it down, but I'm going to try. Uh, I'm not going to die for it, okay? But did you, who sent me the fried, deep fried broccoli? Was that you, Jody? Don't ever do that again. Shame on you. Like, you ruined my meal. I think I was eating dinner. And then I get this picture. I thought it was like fried fish or something. You're like, you ever tried fried broccoli? I'm like, I mean, I kind of like threw up in my mouth. And, uh, you know, no, never tried fried broccoli. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how many of you ever heard of fried broccoli? Like three people in here, okay? So uh, it's good. Yeah, whatever. That's, yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, I'll do the preaching right here. Uh, so <laughs> but uh, uh, what was I saying? Okay, so a conviction is something that you would be willing to die for, all right? A preference, not so much. You have a preference, but a conviction is something you're willing to die for. Uh, and, and, and it's important to have convictions. Well, the Apostle Paul had some convictions, and uh, we're going to talk about that. So uh, Galatians chapter 2, you found your place. Let's all stand, read a couple verses, get right into it. Look at verse 11. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. I mean, it's the Apostle Paul, right? This is probably the, one of the greatest Christians that ever walked on the planet I mean, so much so he penned most of the, you know, more, the majority of the New Testament that we read, okay? I mean, it's, it's, he was very influential in the church, obviously, uh, Gentile, uh, apostle to the Gentiles. Look here, verse 12. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, the Jews. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. In other words, Peter's uh, hypocrisy did not just affect Peter, it also affected the local church. It was affecting Barnabas. Well, the Apostle Paul realizes what's going on here. Verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel... I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Uh-oh, the jig's up, right? The Apostle Paul done called him on the carpet and said, Okay, big boy, all right, you, you want to live this way and you want to act this way now and now you're affecting other believers that are around you? We got a problem, okay? And church, anytime, let's pray first. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the scripture. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together tonight. Lord, help us to understand the importance of having convictions. Help us to understand the importance of being careful who we allow to influence us. And Father, may we understand how great of an influence we each have on other people. Uh, Lord, I think sometimes we take that for granted and don't stop and realize that there's other people that are listening to us and learning from us, Father. God, help us tonight and give us wisdom. And Lord, uh, I pray that your will would just be done in each of our lives spiritually, Father, that we would, Lord, that we would just, uh, Lord, bring all of our, everything we have going on before you, dear God, and allow you to work on those situations, Lord. And we would just allow you to teach us as we look at these verses tonight. And Lord, may we leave here, Lord, to change people, Lord, with a better knowledge of how to serve you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. But church, it's a big deal when... Uh, when what we believe and what we are teaching is influencing someone uh, and it's taking them away from the truth. That's a huge deal. It's a huge deal in the local church. Uh, I, I've been criticized before for making comments about certain religions and people have said things about the fact that I'll name certain groups and certain people. Friend, listen, uh, what am I supposed to do? You know, play charades and hope you get it? You know, say, well, I mean, you know, you got to fill in the blanks, church, you know. No, the Apostle Paul didn't do that, okay? He called a spade a spade. And we are, we are the Grace Baptist Church for a very specific reason. 
We believe what we believe. And, 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 and trust me, I understand this. There's a lot of churches out in South Alabama. And not every church believes the way that we believe. And that's fine. We believe in soul liberty. Everybody can worship how they want to worship, okay? But we meet here at Grace Baptist Church. And uh, we want to honor the Lord. And we believe a certain way. And, and, and that's it's who we are, okay? Uh, and, and, and so we, we got to understand that when someone or another ministry or a YouTube influencer or someone, uh, you know, a, a false doctrine is introduced into the local body of believers here, we got to talk about it. Like, it, it needs to be dealt with, you know. Uh, I mean, I, if, if, if Brother Austin, and, and he's not doing this, but if Brother Austin was having a little conversation off to the side after church services or calling other members in the church and saying, you know, let me share with you what I learned about Calvinism. I'm really kind of I'm really kind of digging this. And, you know, maybe it's not this uh, for whosoever kind of mentality. Maybe, maybe right, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We string you up, Brother Austin. But, you know, but, but if he did that, and, and, and somebody came to me and said, you know, Brother Tim, my Brother Austin hit me up about this whole Calvinism thing, and he really believes that, that we're, he's really kind of leaning towards the fact that God chose who was going to be saved. And if I just said, oh, it's okay, brother, just pray for him, it'll be okay, I would be doing the local church you a disservice, okay? You ought to fire me immediately, right? I, what I should do is go to Brother Austin and say, hey, brother, we need to have a conversation. I love you. But you need to understand, this is what we believe. And if you don't believe that, and if you don't believe what we believe from the Scriptures, you do not have to be a member here, okay? It's not like we put a gun to people's head and say, join the church, you know, we're going to shoot you. No, you volunteer in, okay? It's not I me. Mean, you, you said, hey, I want to be with you guys. I want to worship with you all and believe what you all believe and be part of you all. Okay, that's great, okay? And then when that changes and that ceases to exist, then Brother Austin needs to find him another church home, okay? Uh, and, and so... The Apostle Paul, there's something going on here. And the Apostle Paul had some convictions. And church, you need some convictions, right? There's some things you ought not split hairs on, okay? Like, friend, it, it, just take some of the fundamentals of the faith, all right? Do you really believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary? Amen. I absolutely believe that. To the degree that I would be willing to give my life for that belief, all right? It is a conviction, right? A conviction, right? I mean, do you really believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay, it's a conviction. You believe that with every ounce of your being. It is a conviction. Do you believe that the blood atonement is the only way for someone to have their sins forgiven? Absolutely. It's a conviction. We believe it, right? I mean, with, with, with the, with the, with, to the depths of our soul who we are, we are willing to lay down our life for those convictions. We absolutely believe them. Well, Peter is being hypocritical in the text here. And uh, the Jewish brethren showed up and, and, you know, and he's acting one way around the Gentiles. He's acting one way around the Jewish brethren. And, you know, and so the Apostle Paul, he literally withstood him to the face and called him on the carpet about this. Peter had no problem uh, eating dinner with the Gentiles, you know, the Gentile brothers there in Antioch. Uh, and then, you know, when, when, the, when, when the elite from Jerusalem arrived, well, then it became an issue, right? How convenient for, uh, for Brother Peter. And I'm not trying to pick on Peter tonight. Obviously, you know, nobody's perfect. But in our text, that's what's going on, okay? And so if you look at verse number 14, in verse number 14, But when I saw that they walked not upright according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And so the first thing we notice here is that the Apostle Paul had some pretty good discernment. All right, The Apostle Paul was in tune enough uh, with the Holy Spirit, God working in and through his life, and he was yielded enough to the Lord that he had some discernment and he recognized this. Notice the first four, the first four words of verse 14. He says... But when I saw, but when I saw. You know, there can be a couple conversations going on and you may hear something and then somebody else around you may hear something and discern something completely different. A church leader may listen to that and think, that's not good, that's unhealthy. Another person, just a regular church member, may listen to that and think nothing about that, okay? Church, I, 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 it's important for us to understand that God Almighty does give I really believe this, our church leadership discernment, discernment. And there are times where you may not understand a situation or times where you may not just get it, it may not make sense to you. And there are some times where we literally just have to trust the leadership 
that God has placed over us, okay? And I don't mean to make light of being a church member versus being a church leader, but think with me in a, in a family situation. There may be times where the wife may not understand the husband's position. There may be times where the kids do not understand the wife, the mother, and the father's position. But guess what? They're still expected to obey those that are over them and follow that leadership, right? That's biblical, okay? And so in the local church, God's given us leadership. And Paul is discerning that something is going on. And he said unto Peter, verse 14, it says, before them all, before them all. And so uh, for the apostle Paul, I mean, he, he, he's realizing this, that, that Peter's compromise has literally affected the church and so Paul did this openly he, he viewed Peter's actions as a threat to the liberty that every child of God has in Jesus Christ and so P Paul's mindset is I'm not gonna let that happen on my watch okay Peter's not gonna have this hypocrisy in his life and be one way around the Jewish brethren and be one way around the Gentile brethren these Judaizers, Judaizers have crept into the church and Peter starts listening to their influence and now he is being swayed uh, to, to think like them. And so the Apostle Paul deals with it. Church, Peter, we, I think we all would agree, Peter knew better, right? Peter knew the truth of the gospel. Even Jesus had taught Peter to disregard the Old Testament dietary laws, okay? And so he, he knew that. He understood that. And, and now Peter is being swayed in his thinking in regards to the gospel. I'm reminded that even if Jesus Christ teaches you something and then you listen to a, an influence that is not truth, we can be swayed, right? So, I mean, you, you could be set in stone, solid on an issue, right? I believe in the virgin birth. It is a fundamental of the faith, right? And your mind is made up. I believe that Calvinism is, is not right. It, it's, it's not a biblical teaching. It is heresy. And the Bible doesn't teach that. God has not chosen anybody to be saved, right? He wants everyone to be saved. He knows, but he hasn't chosen and then all of a sudden, you start watching your little podcast by this Calvinist preacher. All of a sudden, you start reading a couple pamphlets that are putting out by Calvinist authors. Let me tell you, it's very likely you might start thinking that way, okay? And so we have to understand the gravity of influence that people can have in our life. And, and, and the Apostle Paul, with his discernment, he realizes that, man... Peter's doing this. Peter has been listening to these cats. Peter's now thinking like these cats. And now Barnabas has been swayed along with him. And, and, Paul, and Paul's mind, hey, it's, it's Peter, it's Barnabas. Who's next, right? Is the entire church going to start believing this way and thinking that you got to keep the Mosaic law to maintain your salvation? I mean, they've been taught better than that. And so church... You, you could have been raised in a good, solid Christian home. You could absolutely know the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God, but who we allow to influence us is going to have a, play a great role in what we believe. And, and, and this is a danger with these rattlesnakes that we carry around. Rattlesnakes. I mean, you can pull up somebody's blog, somebody's YouTube preaching, and boy, you watch this, oh, I kind of like that, you know. And I'll have people send me like YouTube preaching little clips and stuff. And a lot of times, if I know the preacher, I know about them, I'll message them back. And I'll, if it's a, if it's a uh, you know, kind of a situation they'd avoid, I'll say, hey, brother, hey, sister, you just need to know that that person believes this, that person believes that. And I've had some Christians say, well, preacher, I, I just eat the meat and spit out the bones. That's fine, okay? I, I hear what you're saying. But if you're not careful, you might, you might choke on a bone too, okay? You might not spit out all the bones, right? And, 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 and the more of that, and again, and you know, I've had people say, well, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I understand what they're saying, but that influence, you know, you watch one, one clip, and then the algorithms just send that person back to your, you know, your feed, and all of a sudden now you're watching all these clips and all this preaching, and now all of a sudden, guess what? You're doing like Peter, and you're thinking completely opposite of what the truth is. And now you've influenced another believer, and you've sent that clip to somebody else in the church, and they're watching it. Man, maybe Calvinism's not a big deal. Man, maybe we are going to go through the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. I mean, man, this guy's right on all this other stuff. I mean, surely he's right on being mid-trib. Friend, listen, we, we believe what we believe for a reason, right? All right? And if it's your conviction, then you're willing to die for it. If it's not your conviction, then you need to figure out what your conviction is, okay? 
A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And if you go back and forth and say, well, I can sit under this Calvinist teaching, but then I can sit under this preaching over here that's anti-Calvinist, or I can sit under this mid-trip preaching, and, but over here I can sit under... Hey, listen, you, you don't get the best of both worlds, okay? You have to pick a lane as a child of God and say, this is what I believe. This is what I believe, right? And so we meet at the Grace Baptist Church because we believe what we believe. We have a statement of faith. And we agree to that statement of faith. And so Peter, he, he, knew, he knew the truth of the gospel. He knew that he was saved by grace. He knew that he didn't have to do anything to be saved other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that. And then he starts listening, watching a little YouTube blog, starts watching this little podcast. And all of a sudden, you know what, hey, he starts eating differently around certain people because, you know, he just, he's kind of wishy-washy on, on the matter. Friend, listen, Paul discerned that something was, was wrong here. Now, Peter's so quick to change his coat, sort of like when, you know, he was following Jesus afar off. Do you remember when uh, the Lord was being taken to be crucified and uh, Peter's out there and they said, well, you, you kind of you kind of talk like them that follow that Jesus, you know? And don't you know him? And he said, no, I don't know who you're talking about, you know? And they said, you kind of look like that guy, Jesus, you know? Don't you know? Are you sure you don't know him? And for listen, he denied the Savior three times. I know not the man, okay? And so Peter's been in this kind of situation before. He followed afar off. See, church, I think there's a danger in following Jesus afar off. Because when you follow afar off, that leaves room for you to make some different decisions. When you walk right next to him, hey, I'm identifying with Jesus Christ. When you walk right next to him and say, listen, he's my Lord, he's my Savior. Yes, I look like him. Yes, I talk like him. Yes, I want to be like him. You know what I mean. We want to be like, we want to follow the Lord, live like he lived. And friend, listen, we want, we, we want everyone to know that we are a born-again child of God that Jesus is our Savior, that we are His disciples, and we're not ashamed of it, friend. But when you follow afar off, it leaves a little room for a, no, nah, I don't know Him. At Grace, I don't know nothing about Grace Baptist. I ain't never been to Grace Baptist. You know? That ain't a Bible. I, that's, just, that's just old book I got. I got it at the flea market last week. That's not a Bible. You know? And friend, listen, J Peter ha has been in this situation before. Now, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And so the, the young believers in that church, no doubt, are following Barnabas. They're following Peter. They're following the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul's mindful of this. And, he, and he's already told them, you follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. And church, there's nothing wrong with our young people and even adults following other believers that are following the Lord. But listen to me. When Brother Tim's not following Jesus, don't you follow me. Don't you follow me. Hey, listen, when our church leaders are doing things, are making decisions that are not becoming of a Christian and they're not following Jesus, don't you follow them. Don't say, well, well, Brother Rafe does it, so it must be okay. You know, Miss Opal does it, so it must be. Hey, listen, I don't care who they are. If they're not following Jesus, you don't follow them. That's biblical. But Paul said, follow me as I follow as I also am of Christ. That's a good thing, okay? And so this is a time in Peter's life when others should have not followed him. This is a time when, when Barnabas, who, who, who should have known better, right? Again, there's all this should have, would have, could have. Barnabas knew the truth. And yet he sees, he sees Peter doing this. And so now, Peter, now Barnabas is following suit. And this is a time when nobody should have been following Peter. In fact, they should have ran to the Apostle Paul and said, Hey, listen, Paul, we got a, Apostle Paul, we got a situation, right? There's people that are being swayed because of what Peter's doing here. And so Paul had some great discernment. But then the, notice the discussion here in verse number 15. He said, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 15. Uh, after after he, he asked him the question, he says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of of the Gentiles. The rest of this chapter is literally a summary of what Paul said to Peter. And the personal pronoun we in verse 15, he's referring to himself and Peter, Paul and Peter, and the other Jews by birth. Now notice the last phrase in verse 15. He says, and not sinners of the Gentiles. The Jews would use this lingo towards Gentiles in a condescending way. In other words, they would be talking down to the Gentiles, sinners of the Gentiles, right? And it's likely that Paul used this language to shame Peter for his, his, his lapse back into Jewish prejudice. Now he's, he, he's, being, he's being racial, he's being prejudiced again. He's showing, uh, he being, he's being partial. 
And so Paul makes this point clear in the next verse. Look at verse 16. He said, knowing that a man is not justified, he said, by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, this verse is really the point of the entire epistle here, the entire book of Galatians. And so Paul knew this truth. Peter knew this truth as well. He knew it to be true. And because Peter knew this great doctrinal truth, you know, Peter of all people should have known better than to revert back to you know, that old form of Judaism, right? He, he shouldn't have been going back to that. He shouldn't have even entertained that and those ceremonial rules and, and you got to eat a certain way and keep these dietary laws in order to maintain your salvation. He knew that was not the truth. Church, justification is through faith and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keeping the law has nothing to do with it. Listen to, listen to me. Nobody's going to heaven because they did good. Right? That, that's it. You know? Now you say that someplace, oh, you're crazy, preacher. If you don't live it, you ain't going. Listen, nobody's going to get to heaven because they lived a certain way. And if you believe that, then you do not believe that salvation is by faith and grace alone. You don't believe that. You believe that you got to do something to get there. I ain't got to do nothing. I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore my sins have been forgiven, past, present, and future. I'm going, friend. Now, if I want to hear, enter in thou will, enter in thou good and faithful servant, well done thou good and faithful servant, then I, I better live right, okay? If I want to have some rewards when I get there to cast back and give back to Jesus, then I better live right in this life. But to say you got to do something and be something and keep these dietary laws and look a certain way and dress a certain way and think you're going to get to heaven, that's called legalism. Amen, you know. It, 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 I don't know, I'm getting sidetracked on this. It astonishes me, you know. So, so, so often independent Baptists are, are labeled as being legalists. Oh, that Pastor Tim, he's a legalist. His wife and daughters, they only wear dresses and skirts. And Brother Tim, he doesn't wear dresses and high heels. He only wears pants, you know. They're a legalist. They don't even understand what the term means. You know, literally, right? They don't, okay? When you call somebody a legalist, you're saying that they believe you must do something and be something to make it to heaven one day. Listen, I, I don't dress like a boy, and my girls don't dress like a girl so that they can go to heaven. <laughs> That's nothing to do with it, you know? I mean, but, but folks just, oh, they're legalists, you know? They use that old King James Bible, you know? They, they don't use all the new stuff, you know? And, and it just... People say these things and they don't even understand what they're talking about. Uh, Peter should have known better. Barnabas should have known better. And so the Apostle Paul, there's a discussion here. Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Hey, let's add another one in there. You can't be, baptism will not get you to heaven. Amen. Is that not a work, you know? You had to do something. You had to drive to the creek. You had to walk up to the baptistry. You had to put on a certain garment, you know, and you had to be dunked under the water and brought back up. That is an action. That is a work, okay? Now, Old Testament, ceremonial laws, things like that. New Testament, baptism, you know, uh, the Lord's Supper, communion. Friend, listen, there's nothing that can be done to merit us one second in the gates of glory, right? It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ plus nothing minus nothing. That's it. You can't add anything to it. And so there's a discussion here. Uh, look at, at the end of verse 16. He said, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Look what he said. He's talking to Peter in front of all of them and he says, and not by the works of the law. He's like, Peter, we have believed on Jesus because our faith is in Jesus, and we're justified by our faith in Jesus. And Peter, it's not about what you eat at a meal, man. You know? We, you know this. We know this. And he's rebuking him. He's literally withstanding him to his face in front of everyone. Paul references an Old Testament passage here to, to further get his point across. He said, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Church, when you think about the law, this is important to keep in mind. And we learned this going through the book of Galatians, but the law is our school, was our schoolmaster, is the way the Bible calls it. In other words, uh, the, the, law can, the law does not minister grace, right? The law of God, based, literally, what it does, it proves to you and I, it proves to the enti God's entire creation 
that we are guilty before a holy and a righteous God. That's what the law does, okay? Now you don't throw, yeah, here's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw the law out because it only ministers death, right? The law is still very important, okay? I mean, aren't you glad that the Old Testament says, Thou shalt not kill? Amen. That's a good one, right? Amen. Praise God, you know. I mean, glad it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, that's good, okay? Listen, the, the law's not bad, all right? But understand that it does not minister grace. There is no salvation in the law. There is no grace. There's, I mean, it's, it really proves to us that, that we're guilty. Well, how does it do that? Because when you start looking at the law of God, you realize quickly that we've all messed up. Amen. Amen. And that none of us are perfect. We all got problems. We've all made mistakes. We are, we are sinners by nature. We are born sinners. And the, when you read the law of God, we're going through a Bible challenge right now. And I promise you, you that are started in the Old Testament, you get, in, you, you get into the law, friend, listen, you're reminded quickly, man, and there were some serious consequences for them old boys in the Old Testament. They got put to death for a lot of things. I mean, man, if a kid was rebellious, you stoned them. You took them out in the city, just killed them with rocks. How'd you like that, teenagers? How many kids do we have left in church, you know? I mean, they, they just handle things differently. The law ministered death. I mean, if, if, if a woman committed adultery, kill her. I mean, just like, you know, we're all good points. She's like, well, it wasn't enough for the guys. I mean, they, maybe they did the stoning. I don't know, you know? I mean, it just, it was different. It was different. But the law did not minister grace. Friend, until you get to Jesus Christ, you don't, you mean, that's where the grace starts, Okay. When you get to the grace, when you get to the where, where Jesus died for our sins, He paid the penalty. Listen, He satisfied a holy and a righteous God because we cannot do it. We're not perfect. Now, verse number 15 and 16 here give us the Jewish Christian position. But notice verse number 17. Paul said, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, look what he said, we ourselves also are found sinners. He said... Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? He's asking Peter this. Is Christ the minister of sin? And then he answers him because it's a rhetorical question. And Paul looks at him and says, God forbid. God forbid. Jesus is not the minister of sin. Paul is literally scolding and scoffing Peter's behavior, okay? The prideful Jews of that day, they felt in many ways that they were not sinners because they had kept the law of God. Almost like a prideful way, you know. I mean, uh, e even the Apostle Paul, I mean, he was very prideful at first before he got saved. He was, uh, he, was a very, uh, he was a very good Pharisee, Sadducee. I mean, he kept the law of God and, you know, he prided himself in that, you know. And, uh, but but he, re he eventually realized that he had broken one of God's commands, thou shall not covet. Right. So he said, he said, I had not known lust but by the law because it says thou shall not covet. That's what it says. And so the Apostle Paul even realized that he had broken the law of God. And so Paul asked Peter, he said, you know, he said, is, is Christ the minister of sin? And then he says, God forbid. Uh, friend, listen, the Jews might have prided themselves in thinking that they've done good, but the reality is, church, even the best that we can do is as filthy rags. And that's not to make light of our service to God, but it just helps us to understand that, man, we, we got to really understand that if it weren't for the grace of God, we'd all be in trouble. All of us, you know. And even our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ a minister of sin? God forbid. He wanted Peter to really think about this change of heart that he was having in regards to this doctrinal issue. He asked Peter this absurd question, right? Did Christ make you a sinner? Did Christ make us a sinner, Peter? He really wants you to think about it. Now, the answer is obvious. He answers it, God forbid, no way. But think about what Peter was doing, church. He was rebuilding that which was torn down the moment, he got, the moment that he got saved, justification by the law. He's rebuilding that now. Okay, so he gets saved by the grace of God, and the moment that he got saved, justification by the law was obliterated in his life. I mean, it was abolished. It was, it was done away with. He realized, he repented, he realized that there's no salvation in that. My salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now this is what he's doing. He's rebuilding that old doctrine in his life. He's rebuilding that. And so Paul looks at him and says, okay, so then Peter, since you think this is right, did Jesus make you a sinner? Is Jesus, is Jesus causing this? 
And the answer is, of course not. Jesus doesn't do that. But when a man does this, he literally becomes a sinner again. I mean, think about it. The law condemns, it doesn't forgive. And so now Peter's saying, okay, well, you got to do this and you got to keep this. Okay, Peter, you just put yourself back in that category where there's no salvation, buddy. Now, obviously, he was saved and he didn't lose his salvation. But, but Paul's making, trying to get him to think about the gravity of what he is starting to believe again. Church, when you accept Christ as Savior, you are justified by faith, okay? And think with me, okay, the law, and don't take this out of context, the law becomes of no value to you the moment you trust Jesus as Savior in regards to salvation. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense? Okay. The moment you get saved and you say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, in that moment, the law of God is of zero value to you in regards to salvation. None whatsoever. Now, in regards to as a standard and a way of living, it becomes very essential in our life, all right? But friend, when it comes to salvation, which is what the situation was here, friend, listen, it, it doesn't help us. The law condemns. It does not forgive. And so when we work to rebuild that which we once acknowledged was useless and of, of no saving value, think about what we're doing. We're, we're declaring by our actions that we've made a mistake. I believed wrong, and, and maybe the way that I was thinking back then when I allegedly got saved was incorrect. And so now we gotta, we got to eat a certain way and keep these ceremonial laws and do all this stuff. And so, I mean, it's almost like they're saying that Peter was saying, I made a mistake in my life. I made a mistake. I believed wrong or something like that. And, uh, and so while he lived like a Gentile, he was tearing down the ceremonial law. While he lived like a Jew, he was tearing down the gospel of grace. And so, church, the law of God cannot bring anyone to resurrection ground. It does not bring anyone to the place of salvation. All it can do is send somebody straight to the grave with no hopes of a resurrection, right? It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ that there is salvation. So we see Paul's discernment. We see the discussion that he has here. And, uh, and I want you to see a couple... A few more things real quickly. We'll probably not have time to finish all this. But uh, notice that after the discussion here, the Apostle Paul, he deals with a principle, a position, and a perspective. Now, look at verse number 19. Notice, notice what Paul states first, his principle. He said, for I though, he said, for I through the law am dead to the law. Look what he said, that I might live unto God. So the law ministers death. He said, I'm dead to the law. All right. Now, the death penalty, if you go back and study your Old Testament, you'll find the death penalty uh, was attached to breaking every one of the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, you broke them, you, you were put to death. I mean, it was a big deal. The death penalty haunted every wrong act under the Old Testament law. And this is clearly seen in the book of Leviticus. And you can go back there and look. If you go back and look at Leviticus chapter 20 later, you will see that. I mean, it's all through there. Leviticus 20 verse 2, verse 6. I mean, all through it. And then uh, even in the book of Exodus, I'll read a couple to you. Listen to Exodus 35 and verse 2. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Listen to this. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. So it says, you know, hey, Old Testament, if you got caught working on Saturday, you're dead. Dead, right? I mean, it's a, it's a done deal, all right? This morning in our, in our message, we saw that, right? They said, oh, he picked up his bed on the Sabbath. He worked on the Sabbath. That's horrible. And the old boy got saved. He got healed. Jesus was there, right? And, and, and so, I mean, but they were so quick. Oh, you, you broke the law. I mean, that's the death penalty. And that's all through the Old Testament. Numbers 51 and verse 51 says, And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levite shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. No strangers allowed. Uh, Numbers 18 and verse 7. Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil. And ye shall serve. I have given your priest's office unto you as a service and of a gift. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. All through Exodus chapter 21, man, there's, there's commands. And if you don't keep them, you are put to death. And so the law can't save. The law ministers death. And Peter should have known this church. And he did know this. But again, I just can't, I can't, I cannot get away from the fact that he was influenced. Man, he just, eh, you know, nothing else to do. Just watch that YouTube clip. Man, that sounds pretty good, you know. Hmm. And I've heard Brother Tim say that before. 
man, you know, Brother Tim, Brother Tim says that, you know, Brother, Brother Tim teaches us that, uh, that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, but this is saying there may have been something else going on, you know. This guy over here, he says that, you know, this guy over here says that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the local church is not that big a deal. I mean, you don't really have to have a local church, you know. I mean, you can just meet together, do your own thing. You don't need a church, you know. But Brother Tim talks about having a, how important a church is. You know, Brother Tim teaches us that from the Word of God that we're not going to go through the tribulation period, that the Lord's going to rapture us out. But, man, this old boy here, I've been listening to him for a couple of weeks, and he's really convinced that we are going to go through the first three and a half years, and then God's going to take us out of here. And Brother Tim teaches us that, you know, we're saved and we don't ever have to go to hell. But, but this guy I'm watching on YouTube, he's telling me that, that, you know, that Christians have to pay for their sins in hell, but then they get to come out and they don't have to go to the eternal lake of fire. But Brother Tim don't say that when he preaches. I kinda, this kind of sounds interesting. I want to I listen to a couple more just to kind of see what he's saying and maybe ask some people about it. And friend, listen, you get influenced and you start listening and, and you can't help it. I'm just telling you. Some of that is going to rub off on you, right? And so you've got to be so very careful about what we let come in our eye gate and our ear gate. And again, I'm not saying, you know, that you shouldn't believe a certain way. If you want to believe in that stuff, that's fine, right? I believe in soul liberty, but this ain't the place. It is what it is, you know. Well, preacher, we might lose some people. This ain't the place. This ain't the place, you know. We believe what we believe. We stand on it on the authority of the Word of God. It is a conviction that we're willing to die for, right? Don't tell me I'm going to pay for my sins in hell, friend. I'm not. Don't tell me that a, a homosexual cannot be born again because brother so-and-so preaches and believes in the reprobate doctrine. I don't believe that. I don't believe this book teaches that, friend. And I'm going to tell everybody, and I'm going to preach it here, and if they, don't, if, they, if they don't agree with that, they don't have to worship here. Right. It's that simple. We don't do what we do for numbers. We don't do what we do so we can have a certain amount of tithes. And well, we got support missions, preacher. Got to make sure we got that $100 for every missionary coming in. Listen, that doesn't cross my mind when I get in the pulpit and preach. Amen. None of that stuff. Because I'm not a hireling. I believe what I believe from this book. And there's been times where the Holy Spirit has literally, you know, there's been some things where God's been like, Tim, you need to look at this again. And I have, right? And I've sought the Lord. And I've, I've had people try to convince me of things. And I've diligently searched the Scriptures and compared Scripture with Scripture and, and done my research and my study and prayer. And, and I come back to it. And I'm like, brother, I just don't see it, man. It's and I'm like, I'm literally try, almost trying to see it because I, I don't want them to be like wrong. But it's like, I don't see it. I was standing outside with a guy one time. He looked at me and we, we, we did not agree. He was a visiting missionary. And he said, one of us is wrong. I said, yep, we are. <laughs> you know what? But we both can't be right. We both can't be right. But as long as I'm pastoring here, this is what I believe is right. And it's just where we're going, brother. You know? And, uh, and he's doing his own thing. And, you know, but it just, church, it's, we got the influence. There's so much of that out there now. And we listen to it and we hear it. And you got to be so careful. Be very careful. Be very careful. So the Apostle Paul, he, he has, there's discernment, he has a discussion. Uh, there's a principle in verse number 19. He says, for I through the law, uh, I don't know, what verse number, he said, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Okay, now think with me, okay. Uh, the believer is not dead to the law as a standard, but dead to the law in regards to grace and mercy and forgiveness, right? It's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole different a uh, whole different thing there, okay? It's important to help us to have a standard to live by, uh, but not for salvation. Now, notice the position of, of, of Paul in verse 20. He said, he, he's looking at Peter now in front of everybody. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, look what he said, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now think about it, being identified with Jesus, we, we, we step out of the graveyard, if you will, being condemned by the law unto resurrection ground, being justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Two major things that we should realize in this new position, as Paul said, church, you are identified with Jesus Christ. So Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. So think with me, when Christ died, think with me, you died as well. When Christ died, you died. 
Jesus Christ not only died for me, okay, think with me, he died as me. He died in my place. He took my sins on his body on Calvary, right? He took on all the sins of the world, friend. Every sin, every wicked thing that you think is so horrible and so bad. Listen, I don't even want to name a bunch of them because it's just, I don't want to do that. But all the nasty, horrible, immoral things you can think of, Jesus died for those sins. You can't show me anything in that Bible that tells me that the blood of Christ can cleanse this, but not this. It can cleanse this, but not that. You can't find that, friend. Uh, he died for all sin. He shed his blood for all sin. Now, I understand there are some sins that have some really bad consequences, and they affect people in a, in, in a greater way and in a, in a, to a, a greater degree than, you know, uh, you know, some other sin. I understand that. But in the eyes of God Almighty, sin is sin. Sin separates. Oh, yeah, you might not have robbed a bank, but you talked back to your mama and disrespected her. Oh, yeah, you might not have went out and, and, and committed some act of immorality and cheated on your wife or your husband or got involved in homosexuality, but you know what? You cheated on that test at school the other day. Oh, you can't compare that, preacher. Oh, yes, you can. Amen. Sin is sin, but we don't, us, us good Baptists don't like to look at it that way because we, we don't do all that bad stuff. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. Oh, you're not into the whole transgender movement, but guess what? You, don't, you, you listen to some music that don't glorify God Almighty. Amen. Oh, that's different, preacher. Oh, it's, it's all ungodly, okay? And we've got to understand that sin is sin. And church, salvation, faith in Jesus Christ has nothing to do with how we live or behave. But the, the law of God as a standard to help us to live right and do right is a good thing. We're identified with Christ. Look what Paul said. He adds here. He said, nevertheless, I live. So Jesus died for me. He died as me, if you will. He took our sins on his body on the cross. And then Paul said, nevertheless, I live. Think about it, okay? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Hey, and guess what? The apostle Paul rose from the dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Tim Wiggum rose from the dead. Listen, in so many ways you think about it. Our resurrection is already taken care of, friend, because of Calvary. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to stress it. I am going to heaven because of the blood of Jesus Christ, friend. I, I, listen, heaven is our home because of what Jesus did at Calvary. It's not a, well, you better live it. You better keep it. You better do this. You better not do that. All right, Paul said, he said, nevertheless, I live. And then notice what the, another important uh, position he took here. He said, basically, he was indwelt by Christ. He said, yet not I, verse 20, he said, but Christ liveth in me. Church, think about this, okay? It is only the power of God that's in us. He said, Paul said, Christ liveth in me, all right? It is only the power of God that's in us that gives us the ability to live victoriously. That's it, you know? I mean, before salvation, man, we, we really struggled. We, didn't, we did more than struggle. We just stayed in the ditch, you know? It was bad, right, for a lot of us. And then we got saved by the grace of God. Okay, we still have these, this old robe of flesh and it has some tendencies that are bad. And it wants to do this and think this and go there and, and have that. And, and so it's only by Christ that lives in me, that Holy Ghost power, that dunamis power that's in us, right? The power of God that we're able to say, no, Tim, you don't need that. That's not good for you. Stay away from it. It will hurt you, right? And it's only by the power of Christ that's in us. Paul said, nevertheless, I live. And then he, he clarifies it. He looked at Peter. He's like, Peter, and it's not even me, Peter. He said, yet not I. He said, but it's Jesus. It's Christ that lives in me. Hey, friend, if you have a victorious day and you have a day where you feel like you're, man, hey, I'm serving God and I'm living for Jesus, you better stop and realize and understand it had nothing to do with you, buddy. Right, right. Amen. It's only because of the power of Jesus in your life. Right. Amen. Amen. Give God all the credit or you'll fall flat on your face very quickly, right? Well, I did pretty good today. <laughs> Pat myself on the back, you know. I didn't sin one time today. You ever heard people say that? I can go all day without sin. I'm like, whoa, man. Man, you don't have, a, you don't drive in the same traffic I drive in. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, you know what I'm saying, though? But some people are just like, boy, I'm just, boy, I'm just, they do so good. You know, I'm like, man, I need to, what's the recipe, man? How do you do that? And, you know, I mean, we just, and I'm not making light, I promise, and Lord knows why, I'm not making light of sin, all right? But I just want us to understand that we can't do good, 
okay? But it's Christ in us. Paul said, Peter, it's not even me. Peter, he told Peter, he said, he said, it's, it's nevertheless not I. He said, but Christ that liveth in me. And then look at the perspective that Paul had real quickly. Last verse here, he said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. He said, for if righteousness come by the law, look what he said here. He looks at Peter. He says, Peter, I don't frustrate the grace of God. And then he looks at him and says, Peter, if, if this righteousness comes by the law, then Jesus Christ, then, then, his de- then he died in vain, right? Then, then it was pointless for him to be crucified and to go through all of that and be tortured and his body racked with pain and bloodied as it was. He died in vain if that's the case, Peter. And Peter probably said, thinking, whoa, jaw dropped. Man, you know what, Paul? You, you, you're right, man. You're right. And church, and again, I go back to Peter was influenced. Peter was listening. Peter was watching. Oh, because these, you know, these Judaizers came in and, oh, yeah, you got to keep the law. Oh, God, better eat right, Peter, or you ain't going to make it, you know. Okay, sit down with them and I eat a meal differently. Sit down with the Gentiles, eat differently with them. You're being a hypocrite, Peter, you know. Pick a lane, man, you know. You, you, either, you either believe this or you don't believe it. And if you believe it, pick a lane, stay in it, amen. And so Paul, he deals with him. Man, he rebukes him to the face in front of everybody. And some would criticize Paul for that. But I would say this, thank God for Christians that have conviction. Let me say this, if what you believe is not a conviction, don't tell nobody about it. Please, don't tell nobody. But if it's a conviction, open your mouth and herald it forth and tell the world, baby. Amen. Hey, if you believe Jesus died for your sins and rose again, hey, you tell everybody. But if you really don't believe, hey, if you don't, if you really don't, if you really don't believe that Christian purgatory, purgatory is really real and that, you know, and maybe you don't go to hell and pay for your sins after you've been saved. You don't, don't say a word about it, okay? Keep your mouth shut. But if you believe it, you tell everybody and even tell me because I need to know you believe these things, okay? Friend, listen, I think we, we get mixed up on what's a conviction and what's not a conviction. Friend, listen, we need to praise God for some believers to have convictions. And, and if we were all talking and I heard, and I heard you know, Brother Austin or Brother Hugh saying something about something that's just crazy and wild, I'm like, whew, I mean, not minors, but some major doctrinal thing, I'm going to speak up and say, Brother, I, I don't believe the Bible teaches that, you know. And, and that's what a conviction does in your life, right? When you really believe something, you're willing to lay down your life for it. And if it's not a conviction, zip, just zip your lip. Don't say nothing to nobody. Don't post on somebody's blog. Don't talk about it. You can keep listening to it in private because that's what you kind of think. You're kind of leaning that way. But listen, Peter influenced Barnabas. And Paul realized what was happening. And he said, no, we're going to nip this in the bud right now, right now. And church, we've got to be very careful. This little instrument has really, it's just, it's so much stuff out there. And we get bombarded. Man, just stick to your Bibles. Stick to your local church teaching, what you're getting here. Uh, you know, listen, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. They didn't have cell phones back in these days, right? They didn't have television. They didn't have television. They had their local church. They had their leadership in the local church, and they did just fine. And they still got in trouble. Imagine how much more now, right? And so we got to be careful. we got to be careful. Let's stand have a time of invitation. Father, we love you, Lord. Thank you for your word, Father. Help us to be a people here at Grace Baptist with conviction. Lord, that we really believe what we believe. Lord, and nobody's going to change our mind. Lord, we're not going to start believing you got to live a certain way to go to heaven and all these other crazy doctrines that are out there, dear God. We're just going to believe what your word teaches. And Father, we're going to be faithful. Help us to have that as a conviction, Lord, something that we're willing to die for. And therefore, we want to tell everybody because we believe it so much so. Father, help us to be people of your word, Father. Help us to study it. Help us to learn it. And Father, may we do better and do more at reaching our community and this world for Jesus, Father. Bless this invitation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are back.